<laughs> Welcome into Duval Daily presented by GenJag.com. I'm Jordan DeLugo. Thanks so much for being here on Friday, February 17th. Got a fun show for you all today. It is a mock draft show. Seven rounds here for the Jacksonville Jaguars we're going to run through. And I'm not going to bog you down with too much information prior to this mock draft. We're just going to get it going here. But I, I did want to tell you all, it is early in the process. Free agency has not begun yet. Uh, So that's going to massively impact what the Jaguars are going to think that they need going into the draft, areas that they they could potentially avoid or attack in the draft. Free agency will inform that to a certain extent. Um, And I'm also not stacking this draft class as like a complete class together. In this exercise, I'm I'm going to try to kind of just run through these these different rounds and show different options, uh, different picks that I think could make sense for the Jaguars in that range and different outcomes I think are possible for the Jaguars. It's not necessarily uh, a complete class. It's not like um, they attacked every possible need and all that sort of stuff. And that's not usually what happens in the NFL draft. So I just wanted to give you all that little uh, preface to this seven-round mock draft here on February 17th, prior to free agency, prior to the combine, prior to the draft. There's a lot more information that's going to come out that's going to inform the Jaguars 2023 NFL draft class. We don't have all that information yet, so I'm just trying to give you the best I've got here with this seven-round mock. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it, Duval. Why don't we? All right, so the Jaguars, they currently hold the 24th overall pick, would have been the 25th overall pick, but, of course, the Dolphins had a pick taken away from them for their off-field activities, tampering, and such. So the Jaguars are picking at 24 overall. Uh, We've looked at a scenario where the Jaguars have traded up. Uh, Our good friend over at Pro Football Network, Ian Cummings, had the Jags trading up for Devon Witherspoon. What I haven't seen so far is the Jags trading down from that 24th overall pick and you talk about why might the Jaguars feel that they that they could be comfortable in moving down from 24 it's if you get to 24 and there's a handful or more guys that you think could really help you at different positions and you just feel like there's a lot of flexibility a lot of value still left on the board maybe we move down acquire even more value in this draft and, and get more swings at the bat I don't have a problem with that idea one bit and so at 24 overall we're going to trade this pick to the Arizona Cardinals they're going to get 24 overall we're going to get 34 and Pick number 96 in round three here. Keep it pretty simple with that trade. Not too complex. One pick for two picks. Pretty simple stuff there. So we trade down to 34. We're sitting here at the top of, close to the top of, the second round, day two of the draft here. And we're going to take a guy that we would have felt comfortable taking at 24 overall. And that is tight end Luke Musgrave out of Oklahoma, excuse me, not Oklahoma State, Oregon State University. Go Beavers, right? Uh... Luke Musgrave. Why would the Jaguars be in on Luke Musgrave? I think the the there's a lot of reasons you could look at it, right? He's a super talented receiver. He's a guy that I think kind of fits the mold of Doug Peterson tight ends that he has had a lot of success with. When you talk about Dallas Goddard, you talk about Zach Ertz. He's an extreme athlete at 6'5", 6'6", 250, 255 pounds. He's got really good length, really good speed. He's a good route runner. Uh, Even though he's not like a particularly advanced technician as a route runner, but his natural athletic movements make him a good route runner. Um, He's just got the, the, the hip fluidity, the speed, the start and stop, the throttling ability. Um, not at, not at a wide receiver level, but he doesn't need to have it at a wide receiver level. He, again, he's six foot five, six foot six. Uh, I'll pull up his official senior bowl measurements for us just so we're um, right on the money here. Yeah, Luke Musgrave, 6'5 and a half, 255 pounds, 32 and a half inch arms, huge 10 and a half inch hands. That helps you reel that ball in, and you see he catches the ball really well away from his body. He's going to have a big catch radius. He's going to present a, a big target for Trevor Lawrence over the middle of the field. And you talk about, well, 
How does that foil with bringing Evan Ingram back? I think if you bring Evan Ingram back and you have Luke Musgrave, uh, you can use them both at the same time in different roles in this offense. Uh, and, and you can also just kind of groom Luke Musgrave to be the heir apparent to Evan Ingram whenever his contract might, might expire. If you don't bring Evan Ingram back, Luke Musgrave is a perfect replacement for him because he's a guy that I think is going to run in the high 4.4s or low 4.5s at that 255-pound uh, mark. It's just rare to find an athlete like that at the tight end position who also is – already a really good receiving threat with his route running, with his speed, with his hands. Uh, so, And people talk about, well, he was not productive at Oregon State. That's not true. He was productive in 2021. And to start 2022, he played in two games before getting injured. He had 11, uh, 11 catches in those two games, I think a couple touchdowns, almost 200 yards receiving. So, I mean, he was on pace to have a huge year before getting injured. I think when you talk about what the Jaguars like to do in the draft from a general manager standpoint, from a Trent Baalke standpoint, Luke Musgrave fits a lot of the things he likes. He likes length. He likes size. He likes athleticism. He also likes guys that are perceived values because guess what? If Luke Musgrave played the entire 2022 season, then went to the senior bowl and played the way he did at the senior bowl, you'd probably be talking about Luke Musgrave as a guaranteed first round pick. Instead, Balky gets to trade back, gets to still get a guy that he loves from a from a trait standpoint, and gives Doug Peterson a brand new weapon. Uh, so I think it's just a win win situation here. Talking about adding a Luke Musgrave to this offense, um, and quite frankly, if I was the Jaguars, I'd be looking at this draft class and saying, Do I really want to drop fourteen fifteen million on Evan Ingram? Because no. You're probably not going to get a tight end that's going to be as ready, as professional as Evan Ingram in 2023. But that's that's the price of doing business sometimes, right? Um, you're not always going to replace your veterans with guys that are immediately ready to be better than them. But maybe in a year or two, Luke Musgrave would actually present a, a little bit more of a complete skill set than an Evan Ingram. Because Musgrave's not undersized the way Evan Ingram is for the position, but he still has extreme athleticism. So that's the pick at 34 overall after trading down with Arizona, picking up pick 34, picking up pick 96, and giving up 24 overall. Moving on to our second pick here. This is not a pick I would be a fan of, but it's a pick that I could definitely see Trent Baalke slamming the table for. And it's Gervin Dexter out of the University of Florida. Um, I have a late day two grade on this guy. 56 overall is more mid day two. Look, the natural talent, the physical ability, it is there in spades for Gervon Dexter. I mean, the guy is a freak show uh, from a from a size profile, from a physical athleticism profile. He has everything you would want in that regard. For a first round defensive tackle. And he has the flashes of a first round defensive tackle. What he does not have is the sustained play. And he's six foot six, 313 pounds. He's got good length. He's got really good quickness and athleticism and overall power. So, what's the problem here? You just have not seen the consistency. You've seen poor pad level. And you've, he's naturally tall at six foot six, uh, which is taller than most interior offensive line players. So he has a, a bit of a natural leverage disadvantage, does Gervon Dexter. And then you talk about, you just did not see the development in 2022. It was a new coaching staff that he was around, not a familiar system. Maybe if he's in the same system, you see a little bit uh, better of a season out of Dexter in 2022. But it, it did not add up to ultimately what, what you would have expected from a guy who a lot of folks were saying maybe maybe if if Dexter takes a little bit of a step forward this is a first round type of defensive tackle it didn't happen instead it looks like he kind of went in the wrong direction and so you have a guy that uh, is is going to probably end up being a day two pick in my opinion again I would value him more like late day two you know 
back end of the third round, early fourth round, because I do think you are taking a swing here with a guy like Gervon Dexter. I don't think this is like a really safe pick. Um, it is a safe pick in the in that the the guy's six foot six, three hundred ten plus pounds. Like he's got he's got size to work with, but um, and athleticism, physicality. But you've just got to get him going in the back in the right direction. I think this is another pick where you look at Trent Balky, uh, you look at the the type of players he's liked over the years, and you kind of say maybe Gervon Dexter looks like a value to him at 56 overall. And if it's not at 56 overall, if he falls to the third round, I think the Jaguars again would be looking at him. And and what does he potentially add to the team? He adds a guy that can potentially, again, if he reaches his ceiling, be a three-down player, uh, be a a violent interior disruptor, but you got a long way to go to get that, to get that consistently out of Gervin Dexter from the University of Florida. But I definitely could see Trent Baalke valuing him at some point on the second day of the draft. So we've gotten a tight end, we've gotten a defensive lineman, we're going to go back to the offensive side of the ball for the for the first of our two third round picks again we acquired pick number 96 from um from the Arizona Cardinals in that trade down but 88 our 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 first third round pick the pick that the Jaguars uh, owned themselves entering the draft we're going to go with Wanya Morris out of Oklahoma a guy who attended the senior bowl and this is another player you look at uh, played right tackle primarily at Oklahoma. Um, do the Jaguars need another tackle? Well, if Cam Robinson, Jawan Taylor, and Walker Little are all on the roster next year, no, you would look at it and say you probably don't need another tackle. However, I think Morris, if you do not bring back Jawan Taylor, which seems like a possibility, who knows? Who knows at this point how that's going to play out? He's going to get uh, paid. And it's going to be probably in the $15 million range, according to Field Yates. I guessed $14 million. Um, so somewhere in that range, if the Jaguars are unwilling to fork out that kind of cash for Jawan Taylor, I think Wanya Morris makes a ton of sense. And this is a guy that I know Trent Baalke going to like. Why? Look at the arm length on Wanya Morris. 35 and three eighths inch arms, ten and a quarter inch hands. He's almost six foot five, three hundred seventeen pounds. This guy was kind of built in a lab to play right tackle for Trent Baalke, right? And he's got good athleticism. He he's a big boy again at six foot five, three hundred seventeen pounds with those thirty five plus inch arms, big hands, big wingspan. But he uh, he he has the athleticism and the movement that you like. Is he? Look a little raw, a little unrefined at times on tape, yes. But he did go to the Senior Bowl, and he acquitted himself really well. He's got freaky traits. He's got freaky athleticism. Uh, He's a guy that, again, has played a lot of right tackle for Oklahoma. If you lose Jawan Taylor, now you've got your your backup right tackle, right? So, and the way I would look at it, if you lose Jawan, you've got Cam, you've got um, Walker Little, you've got Wanya Morris. Maybe you bring in a veteran swing tackle because you don't want to rely on a rookie. I would understand that as well. We've talked about Andre Dillard here, a guy that has played under Doug Peterson. But Wanya Morris, if you have him, he's your backup right tackle. You've got Walker Little who can play left tackle or right tackle. You've got Jawan Taylor, uh, or excuse me, you've lost Jawan Taylor, but you've got Cam Robinson at left tackle. So basically, Walker Little would be your starting right tackle in this situation and your backup left tackle. Wanya Morris would be your backup right tackle, and Cam Robinson would be your starting left tackle. So you'd have three that you feel good about in any little, uh, like, if Walker Little got injured, you'd have Wanya Morris at right tackle. If Cam Robinson got injured, you'd have Walker Little at left tackle, Wanya Morris at right tackle. You'd have a nice little situation going on there. So Morris wouldn't technically probably be your swing tackle because he doesn't have as much experience at left tackle, but maybe he could be that as well. I haven't seen him play as much left tackle, so or any left tackle. So that would be um, just a situation where the Jaguars would get him in the building and see where he's at, what he can do uh, from a switching sides of the, the line perspective. 
But Wanya Morris, really good athlete, really great length, size, hands. I think Trent Baalke would would be a big fan of this type of prospect. And then at 96 overall, um, it was an interesting point in the draft for me. There was definitely some corners available that I had interest in. Um, I think this is the area of the draft, you know, third round, fourth round, where maybe the Jaguars try to go get a guy that can come in and compete for the starting nickel spot, whether that's a safety who can play nickel or a cornerback that they think can play inside. Um, I pegged Sydney, Sydney Brown here out of Illinois, who was also at the Senior Bowl and uh, a guy that really has shown himself to be a, a versatile weapon on the defensive side of the ball. Played safety, played a little nickel, played um, some, some dime. Like, this is a guy you can move around. You can play. I've seen him play single high. I don't know that he has the range and size to do that all the time, but you can play him in, you know, cover two. I think you can have him. Uh, potentially lock down tight ends, keep up with tight ends. He's not the biggest guy, but he has the strength, he has the athleticism, and he has the quickness and the instincts to just make plays on the football consistently. And getting him in the third round, back into the third round, I think just represents a lot of value, and it represents a guy who can come in in specific situations and try to lock down, help you lock down that middle of the field. The Jaguars have struggled in coverage over the middle of the field. I think Sidney Brown helps you in that regard quite a bit out of Illinois and uh, he's one of those guys from a from a, a culture standpoint from a, a professionalism standpoint this guy's been a pro for a long time already him and his um, his brother twin brother they've been just uh, weight room warriors they take care of their body like no other they're focused on being professionals um, at the NFL level and it's shown uh, clearly and I think Sidney Brown's going to be a really a really tough guy, a really productive NFL player. The only reason he's a third round pick really, again, is because of his height. He does not have great length, Uh, under six feet, under 32 inch arms, but I think he's a hell of a player. And I think the Jaguars would be lucky to land him at this point in the draft. Is he a Trent bulky type of pick? I don't know, but You could also say Chad Muma wasn't a Trent Baalke type of pick. Luke Fortner wasn't really a Trent Baalke type of pick. I think, as John Shipley said on the show earlier this week, Baalke is more willing to kind of uh, overlook maybe some physical deficiencies later in the draft. If it's guys that just appear to be complete studs, which I think Sidney Brown does appear to be that. All right, so 121 overall. This is the area of the draft I think the Jaguars could start thinking about a receiver. Um, I think they love their receivers, but this is also a class that's going to have a lot of talent early and mid day three. That's just the way of the world now. There's always talented receivers. So when I was looking at the guys available, uh, there's certainly some interesting names, a lot of fun names. But at 121 overall, the Jaguars' first pick of day three, I really liked Dante Vion Wicks. And the reason I like Dante Vion Wicks for the Jaguars specifically is he has a skill set, um, a- an athletic profile as well, that really reminds me of Brandon Ayuk. And I can't wait to see how Wicks tests. Because uh, Ayuk did not uh, run a wildly fast 40. I think he was in the four fives and I think Wicks could be even faster than that. But uh, the height and arm length is what really reminds me of Brandon Ayuk here. Uh, Dante Vion Wicks is just under six foot two. He's 212 pounds and he has almost 33 inch arms, 32 and three quarters. So Ayuk has a little bit longer arms. I think he was at 33 and a half, but 32 and three quarter, three quarters at six foot one and a half for Dontavion Wicks, represents really nice length. He can go catch the ball away from his body, and he has a lot of that twitch that Brandon Ayuk shows as well. So when I look at him and how how the 49ers have used Brandon Ayuk, I think the Jaguars could get some of that in their offense, and what is some of that? It's a guy who's a yak monster. You get him the football, and he just makes people miss and picks up easy yards for you, makes your offense easier. He makes everything easier for 
for what you're trying to do. And now you look at Dontavion Wicks at Virginia in 2022. It was not a pretty season uh, for that entire offense. It was just real ugly. And Wicks, he had his fair share of problems too. was not catching the ball the way you normally see him. But then you saw him at the Senior Bowl and he looked like one of the most athletic guys out there. He was catching a lot more with a lot more consistency. I think you saw the hands, you saw the athleticism, the twitchy movements, the ability to go get the football. And so Dontavion Wicks in the fourth round, I think would be a really good value for the Jaguars here. And he adds a skill set, in my opinion, that they don't really have. A guy that can be a yak monster that you can just get on these quick slants, screens, things like that, and he can make something happen out of nothing there. I think that's a really valuable skill set. I also think the Jaguars should be looking to upgrade their running back room in this draft class, and I don't mean anything about uh, upgrading running back one, right? Travis Etienne, locked and loaded. He's your RB1. Love it. But could they add another runner that brings juice, pop, whatever? I think they could. And I think this is a really, really deep running back class. For me, the deepest positions in this class are running back, wide receiver, cornerback, and edge. And so those are things to keep in mind here, for sure. I think there's going to be guys that you can find in those areas at those positions and even an interior defensive lineman from a pass rush standpoint I think there's going to be a lot of talent later in the draft and so at 127 overall the Jaguars second excuse me fourth round pick we've got Israel Abanacanda out of pit running back a young running back only 20 years old redshirt sophomore this guy you want to talk about he you can talk about complementary skill sets at the running back position, right? Um, Travis Etienne, home run hitter, speed guy. Uh, you want to get him outside. You want to get him in space. But he can also do the dirty work in between the tackles uh, a little bit for you. So what do you want to complement that? I don't think it has to be a specific skill set. But how about another guy who can absolutely take the top off the defense? How about another guy who's 5'11", 215, really similar size to Travis Etienne, and actually a pretty similar skill set? Yeah, it's not going to be necessarily a a big-time difference in the skill sets, but do you want another guy who you can put in the game that can take the top off the defense? that is going to be running at a different pace than just about everyone else on the field? Because that's Israel Abanacanda. And I have a a second-round grade on this guy. I don't think he has the best power in this class. I don't think he has necessarily the best lateral agility. But I think he has good lateral agility, and I think he has enough power to run through some arm tackles to finish some runs for you, similar to how Travis Etienne does. And look, the guy is literally a home run waiting to happen. He, like Travis Etienne, moves at a different pace than almost everyone else on the field. And at 5'11", 215 pounds, it's really impressive. I just don't think this is a guy that should be available on day three of the draft. And maybe he won't be. But if he's not, there's going to be another talented runner available. I think upgrading the room, getting another guy that you can can send out there and feel like they're going to execute at a really high level is huge. Of course, Jermichael Hasty is an unrestricted free agent. You don't really know what you have in Snoop Connor yet because the Jags didn't give him much run in 2022. I think adding someone this talented at this point in the draft is just a no-brainer. Now these next two picks I have in the sixth round for the Jaguars, they're, they're going to sound familiar because I think it makes sense, right? I think the Jaguars, late in the draft, should go try to find a quarterback that they feel can be a long-term backup to, to Trevor Lawrence, a guy who maybe brings a little bit more to the field than a C.J. Beathard. And I think they should also go get a kicker. So at 185, I've got them taking Jake Moody out of Michigan. Who knows if he'll be available in the sixth round. Very well could go before that. But there's some other talented kickers in this class that you can look at. And I got Jake Hayner out of Fresno State. Really impressed me at the Senior Bowl. Really impressed me throughout his college career. He's just undersized. But he's got a, he's, he can put some zip on the ball. He's got some athleticism to kind of maneuver in the pocket and evade the pocket. And I just love his field vision and, and, and accuracy. His ball placement is impressive. So those are the two I pegged there. 
And then to round out this draft in the seventh round, I had the Jaguars taking defensive t- tackle Keandre Coburn out of uh, the University of Texas. This is a massive young man, uh, really, really big interior defensive lineman who, when you talk about um, being able to create penetration and stuff the run and just take up space, I think Keandre Coburn can potentially do that. The only reason that he's available still here, here because I do have a fourth round grade on him, thanks to his ability to penetrate and stop the run, he does have shorter arms. And that could potentially mean Trent Baalke ain't drafting him. If that's the case, so be it. It is what it is. Uh, but I really like the skill set that Keandre Coburn brings to the field. I highly recommend y'all going to watch the Texas defensive line because you've got some really fun players with Coburn, Ojomo, some of those other guys. Love some of them. And then finally, we rounded out this draft with Max Melton. Younger brother of Bo Melton out of Rutgers. This is an athletic family. Their father played football at Rutgers. Their mother, I believe, was a women's basketball star. So this is a family with athletic bloodlines. Um, Bo Melton was a receiver last year. Max Melton is a corner. They have similar size. I believe they're going to have similar athletic profiles. And Bo Melton had a tremendous athletic profile. You bring in Max Melton, uh, I think he's going to be about six foot, maybe a hair under six foot, 5'11", maybe around 190, maybe 185 to 190. Not tremendous size, but decent size. And then a guy who, who has ball production. And m- most importantly, seventh round pick, cornerback, you've got to play special teams. Max Melton is a big time special teamer. He's blocked a bunch of punts. He's done a lot for his team in terms of doing the dirty work. He's a guy that can help you as a core special teamer, in my opinion, a guy that'll block punts, a guy that'll do anything you ask him to try to do. And I do think he has the uh, potential maybe to play inside at nickel, maybe to develop into a third outside corner, a fourth outside corner, you know, give Give these guys like Gregory Jr. and Buster Brown a run for their money uh, on the back end of the roster there. So yeah, that is the full seven rounds. Hopefully y'all enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned some things. Hopefully you found the analysis insightful and fun. And uh, we'll just run through these picks one more time. We traded down to 34 with the Arizona Cardinals. Picked Luke Musgrave. Big, athletic tight end with tremendous hands, great speed, perfect fit from what Trent Baalke likes with traits from uh, a Doug Peterson offense standpoint. Luke Musgrave, love that pick. Gervon Dexter at 56 overall. I'm not a huge fan of this pick, but it does feel like a Trent Baalke pick. A guy who had rumblings of potentially being a first round player prior to the 2022 season, didn't quite work out for him, didn't have the year he was looking to have, but Trent Baalke could look at Gervon Dexter kind of like he looked at Walker Little uh, a couple years ago. It's not the injury situation, but it just wasn't quite the right situation for him in 2022 with the new coaching staff, with the new defense. Get him in here and and get him going. I think that he has the potential, again, potential, to be an impact defensive lineman, but he also has the potential to not be in the league in five years, in my opinion. It's going to be up to the coaching staff and up to Gervin Dexter, wherever he does end up making sure that they're putting him in the right situation and getting him um, on track because he has all the physical talent in the world. Wanya Morris at 88 overall offensive tackle. He'll be your backup right tackle or swing tackle in year one, a guy who I think can develop into a starter. The reason I have him pegged to the Jaguars, 35 plus inch arms, great length, great size, good athlete. He just seems like a Trent Baalke pick all the way to me. And if you let Jawan go, if Jawan walks, he gets paid more elsewhere. Wanya can step in and be that backup tackle you need. I've got Sidney Brown at 96 overall. Again, doesn't really meet a lot of the length and size requirements that maybe a Trent Baalke would have, but he has been willing to kind of push those requirements to the wayside later in drafts and in free agency. Like they went and got Darius Williams. He is not a long corner. He's not a long player. So Sidney Brown is just a value at this point in the draft, the safety out of Illinois. Fantastic player. Dontavion Wicks, he can be your rack guy, your yak guy that you don't really have yet. Uh, Really impressive with his length and size. Israel Abanacanda, kind of like your 
your mini Travis Etienne, your Travis Etienne 2.0, your guy, you bring him in here, and now you just have the most explosive backfield in the league, potentially. You went and got Jake Moody, a kicker, to, to add competition for Riley Patterson. Jake Hayner uh, to come in and compete to be a long-term backup. C.J. Beathard is an unrestricted free agent. We'll see how that plays out. And then Keandre Coburn, defensive tack- tackle out of Texas. Max Melton, cornerback out of Rutgers to round out that draft. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Love to know what you think. Hit me up on Twitter at Jordan DeLugo. You can also drop a comment in the comment section below on YouTube. Thank you so much for tuning in Duval and have a great Friday and a great rest of your weekend.